Hello, everybody, and welcome to Heart of the Matter. I'm your host, Elizabeth Vargas. And if you're like me, you may have been reading a lot in the news about accidental fentanyl overdoses that are happening more and more often in this country, whether it's spring break in Florida or various cases around the country where people think they're ingesting recreational drugs like cocaine or prescription drugs like Percocet or Valium, and instead are taking counterfeit pills that contain fentanyl or sometimes only fentanyl. Fentanyl is extremely potent and extremely deadly, and many of these people die very quickly. And one of them is the son of our guest today. His name was Charlie Ternan. He was a senior in college who had back issues, had had back surgery, and went online and was able to find a Percocet, a single Percocet that was nothing but fentanyl. He took it and he died. His parents, Ed and Mary Ternan, have taken their grief and channeled it into a quest, a quest to raise the alarm, a quest to stop other families from suffering what they have suffered. They started a nonprofit called Song for Charlie, and May 10th, a week away, is National Fentanyl Awareness Day. They have partnered with companies like Google, TikTok, the Partnership to End Addiction, even myself. I've joined that effort to raise the awareness about fentanyl, the dangers of it, and the fact that it's everywhere now. They're also working with Snapchat. Snapchat is the social media company, the app through which Charlie was able to procure that single Percocet that contained nothing but fentanyl. If you listened to our podcast a few weeks ago with Sam Quinones, you know that this is something that's happening more and more often. Kids are going online onto social media sites and buying drugs drugs that come from places nobody's sure of and drugs that often are contaminated. So it's an important podcast today. Ed and Mary are incredibly courageous and are really trying to do what they can to make the world safer for kids. So I hope you enjoy our conversation with Ed and Mary Ternan. Ed and Mary Ternan, thank you so much for being guests on Heart of the Matter and for talking about what I think is every parent's nightmare and um, raising an awareness and an alert that needs to be raised in this country around fentanyl showing up in prescription pills, fake prescription pills. You lost your son, Charlie. He was 22 years old, about to graduate with an economics degree from college. Tell me what happened and how you think he got this pill that was pure fentanyl and he had no idea. Charlie was with us um, for a couple months because of COVID Mm -hmm. and he was so eager to get back up to school and be with his classmates and and friends since, yeah, they only had three weeks left um, until they were going to graduate. And he had had back surgery a year prior Mm -hmm. and um, he was complaining to us um, that his back was hurting and so he um, was up there six days and uh, asked a friend, um, you know, he went, had a job interview um, that Thursday, the 14th of May, and uh, he just wanted to chill out and um, play video games and asked a friend who knew somebody on Snapchat um, and he got a Percocet that was not a Percocet. It was a poisonous counterfeit pill, a fentanyl. Fentanyl, pure fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he took the Percocet. He was having back pain. And had he been using Percocet before? Do you know? I mean, was he given Percocet after the surgery? Yes. He knew what Percocet does. And he knew knew what it was going to make him, how it was going to make him feel. And yeah, he never obviously made the job interview. And um, he was so excited about that because he was probably going to get the job. Um, And... uh, we actually think um, Charlie was, in a weird way, being somewhat responsible because he was up there uh, during, you know, the spring quarter of his senior year, and his fraternity brother said, "Let's all go out and hit some golf balls and do some day drinking and forget about, you know, virtual classes for a day. Come on, we're almost done." And he said, "I got this phone call at five o'clock. I can't go. I gotta stay here." And um, at some point during the day, as Mary said, he went to a friend 
who found some some guy on the two of them found some dealer on Snapchat and uh, ordered a Percocet to we think take the edge off and relax a little bit before this final interview, um, but also because of his back pain. Mm-hmm. And what we've been able to piece together is that uh, he was in his fraternity house and. His friends, the last time anybody spoke to him was about 2.30, 3 o'clock that afternoon. And he was, like you said, he was going to do. He was in his room playing video games, killing time until that 5 o'clock phone call that he had to make. Um, And so somewhere between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, he took that pill. Because Mm -hmm. what we know is he never made the 5 o'clock phone call. And his friends found him unresponsive in his room about eight o'clock that night. And by that time, he'd been gone for several hours. And you got that knock on the door and a simultaneous phone call that every parent dreads. They were friends of the family? Yeah. Um, Yeah, they had called me on my cell and it was our pastor and our good friends. um, And... I didn't pick up. It was like 10 o'clock and I just thought, I'll you know, call him back tomorrow morning. And then he called Ed Cell and said, I'm at your front door. Please don't answer the door. And that was a, that was tough. That's what uh, no parent ever wants to do is have somebody knock on your door and say, sit down. We have bad news. Um, and so that was uh you know, the first day of the rest of our life, I guess. I remember saying to them that, uh, you know, everything starts from right now. Um, our old life is gone. And from, from here on forward, we're on, we're on a different path. Um, and this is an experience, sadly, that's shared by a lot of parents around the country from this seemingly completely random, unexpected cause of death among, you know, just your regular run-of-the-mill kids. Um, who are being deceived by these counterfeit pills. Um, We were actually lucky, Elizabeth, in that we found out fairly quickly that fentanyl was the suspected culprit. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of families, because of the way these um, toxicology reports happen and the way the investigations flow, they'll go 30 or 60 days wondering, why did I go in my son's bedroom at eight o'clock in the morning and find him dead in his bed? What mm-hmm. happened? And they don't know until the toxicology report comes back. How did you know right away that it was fentanyl? We, we were, you know, we were not at the death scene. And luckily, Charlie was in Northern California. We were here. We didn't have to go through that wrenching experience, but his friends did. So when we had our friends here at the house with us, we made a phone call to some of his friends. They were hysterical. Um, And one of the officers got on the phone and you can imagine it's kind of a little bit of dark comedy here, but uh, they come to the scene and they ask the fraternity brothers um, when they see a deceased person in the house, could it be drugs? And of course the fraternity boys go, well, of course it's a fraternity. It could be drugs. Um, So the cop at that time says, what we're hearing is it's pills. And that night we were like, well, that doesn't make any sense because Charlie doesn't have a pill problem as far as we know. He just lived with us for 60 days during the very first part of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. One of those things where the kids all went home for spring break, if you remember, and then the universe. Yeah, and nobody went back. Don't come back, right? Right. Right. This was in May of 2020. 2020. Right, very early COVID. Um, And being mama bear, I check everything. So, you know, I went through everything just mm -hmm. like, as moms do, right? Mm-hmm. Just to make sure. We, he was acting just perfectly normal. Yeah. No indication of any signs of trouble or substance use or anything like that. Now, things were weird because of COVID. So, you know, nobody was completely normal during that time. But um, we really scratched our heads with that. Well, we think it's pills. And we had a vague notion that pills were on the menu for kids this age, kind of recreationally, like we heard about chilling out with a Xanax or something. But we thought to ourselves, you know, how much, how many Xanax does a 6'2", 235 pound guy have to take to die? Right. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. Well, we got a call the next morning from a, a, an investigator, a detective. And he was the one who said, listen, we'll wait for the talk screen. But I'm telling you right now, this is fentanyl. Charlie's is the seventh death 
in this county in the last 10 days. So what? we're pretty sure that, yeah. Wait, sure seven deaths in 10 days? In, in May of 2020, we were told he was the seventh death in a 10-day period in Santa Clara County, California in mid-May. Um, and that's when we got online and started searching. You know, we, we Googled Fentanyl Santa Clara County, right? Mm -hmm. And we discovered that um, it had happened before. There had been a young man at Stanford who died six months prior. There was a high school girl who died in San Jose. Her boyfriend was revived. Um, it was on the news, you know, local San Francisco area news, um, Silicon Valley newspapers. There were um, bulletins on the DEA website locally, the medical examiner website, and the sheriff department website. And that's when the, the ideas started crystallizing in our head. We were struck by the fact that other people know about this problem, but the kids don't know. Charlie right. certainly didn't know. And uh, kids don't get their news from page six of the morning paper. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to warn kids, which we really think we need to do, we need to go where the kids are. We've got to figure out how to get to them directly. And that kind of sent us off on our, on our mission. Before we get into that mission, um, backing up your contention as his parents that Charlie didn't have a substance use disorder, you had never seen him abusing drugs or alcohol, you saw no evidence that he was under the influence, um, and he only bought one that day. He bought a single pill of what he thought was Percocet. It looked exactly like a Percocet complete with a stamp, and, and it was nothing but pure fentanyl, which is, as we know, 50 times stronger than heroin, 100 times stronger than morphine. This is deadly stuff. How did he get that pill? Well, he got it from, uh, from a dealer that he connected with on Snapchat. Snapchat. Yeah. And that's a that's a major part of the, um, the the problem here is that the accessibility of these pills, these counterfeit pills, um, has just exploded because every single kid has a cell phone and social multiple social media accounts, and also this generation of kids um, has become accustomed to prescription pills. This is the generation that we started medicating in grammar school in the early 2000s with Ritalin and Adderall for learning differences and Xanax for anxiety and Percocet and Vicodin and Oxy for sports injuries and wisdom teeth. And mm -hmm. so by the time a kid is in high school or college, I mean, 40% of their friends have a prescription pill, pill bottle in their backpack. They're just everywhere. Well, Drug dealers know this. They know that kids have an appetite for pills and kids are on social media. So that's where they advertise their wares. But Snapchat, I mean, I remember being really annoyed when my kids were on it for a time because I couldn't monitor anything. The messages in Snapchat disappear as soon as they're read. Uh, how is it that drug dealers are on Snapchat? I mean, can you walk me through how exactly drug dealers are using Snapchat of all places to peddle pills? Yeah, and, and these drug dealers are savvy marketers. They know what they're doing, and they know their target market. Um, they A lot of times, they will advertise on Instagram where their posts are more permanent. And then when they uh, find the uh, a customer, they will say, let's hop over to Snapchat, right? And, and, and what they call the last mile. The transaction is arranged there with Snapchat because of the fact that the, that the, the snaps disappear. Um, and so it's a very, uh, it's a useful tool. And, and, and uh, these drug dealers have just made themselves available. They, they kind of put themselves out there for kids who are looking for these pills. Um, and it's very easy for kids to find them. Um, we've talked to a bunch of people in the internet kind of reform movement, internet safety world. Uh, we're working actively with Snapchat, by the way. So we have some some view from the inner workings of what's going on there. Um, there's increasing activity on emerging platforms like Telegram and Discord. Uh, there's a lot of transactions that happen on Facebook Messenger. Um, so 
I know you've spoken to Sam Quinones. He mentioned mm-hmm. in, in his book, one of the things that struck me was dealers will always use the latest technology to distribute their goods. And back in the day, in the early part of the opioid crisis, it was the pager that revolutionized right. the access of heroin when that demand came up, right? So you didn't have to go to a dark alley in an inner city to get heroin anymore. You beat the guy and he brought it to your house. So Snapchat and social media is just the next evolution of that. It's the, mo- it's the technology distribution platform of the day. You have, I know there are other parents who blame Snapchat and have protested outside Snapchat's headquarters, accusing it of not doing enough to crack down on these drug dealers. Tell me about your decision. You say that initially you too were furious and angry at Snapchat, but you have now decided to work with that social media platform to try and crack down on this. Why did you change? Why did you make that decision? Well, I think it was... um you know, we wanted to make them our allies, you know, and because that's where the kids are. And so when we told them the story of what happened to Charlie and all these other kids, they they didn't understand. They didn't know the, you know, how bad it was and how deceitful, you know, these drug dealers are, are really just really, you know, deceiving them and saying that they're going to get one thing and it's not, and it could, it could kill them. So I think once we told them that story, of the whole problem, they realized, wow, we didn't even realize that was going on. And, you know, we've had a, they've helped us. We did a, mar- you know, gave us some um, ad credits, credits yeah. and did a research for us and market research. Um, so we've really learned a lot in how we can get to the kids and, and really get the message out so that we can help save lives. Yeah, and I, th- I think this is important, Elizabeth. Um, all of us parents are grieving. And we've had our legs just kicked out from under us by this shock of losing a child. And um, everyone who decides to stand up and get active and, and tell their story and try to address the problem kind of chooses their own lane and they play the hand that they're dealt. Mm-hmm. We initially said, and, you know, I used to work in the, in, in the Internet business and, you know, I'm, I'm a 60 year old businessman. I got some gray in my hair. I knew that the liability shield that the internet, that the social media platforms are protected by would prevent us from any kind of claim against them. Uh, We explored it with some of the top personal injury lawyers in Los Angeles and across the country. You you examined, you know, can we we sue Snapchat? You looked at all our options. And were you told Um, that Section 320 protected them and you had no chance? Yeah. You you know, essentially the law is not on your side. Now, if the law needs to change and the internet policies need to be reformed, okay, that's fine. But we then, you know, we're practical people. We're like, we want to solve the problem. Um, and as Mary said, we thought to ourselves, well, what could we do if we got them to work with us? Mm -hmm. So we're here in Southern California, Snap Inc is headquartered in Southern California. A lot of people think it's a Silicon Valley company, but it's here. We know people who know people who work there. And we started to have a a little reach out to see if we could have a dialogue. Um, and when we finally broke through to them, after a couple of months of a little bit of back and forth, we we were able to open their eyes a little bit. And this is something that some people don't understand. When something bad like this happens, I think there's an instinct to say, especially when it's so shocking and no, nobody knew about fentanyl and fake pills until their child is taken from them. Mm. There's this instinct to say, well, someone should have known about this before it happened to me. Why wasn't this fixed already? Um, And what we've learned is that all of the social media platforms have policies that prevent drug dealing on their platforms. And they thought those were enough, right? But, you know, how do you catch it? One of the things we've learned, which kind of is mind blowing to me, is around the world, 5 billion snaps are published every day. Every day, 5 billion piece bits of content go up and then come off that platform. And disappear into the ether. That's right. And, and, and that is an enormous content moderation challenge, right? But what we were able to tell them is that they needed to escalate this problem 
to more like child endangerment or child sex trafficking. This is not kind of, look, we, pr- we don't allow drug dealing on our platform, like neither does Facebook or Instagram. They know it happens. They can't catch all of it. They have their eyes open for it. But we said, this is different because people are selling this highly potent opioid under the guise of, of these prescription pills that kids are familiar with and they assume are safe. And they're dying like crazy. And your market, we said to Snap, your market is these young people. Mm-hmm. And to their credit, they responded to us and said, you're right. We, how can we help you? Let's work together to do two things. We introduced them to a number of experts that we'd come across to you know, really understand the issue and how these drug dealers are behaving in the fake pill world. And we worked together to create content that re- kids find relatable to push it out on their platform. Do you feel like they're doing enough? I mean, this has become such a serious issue that the DEA this past September issued a very rare public safety alert on the sharp increase in fake prescription pills containing fentanyl and meth. It's the first such alert that the DEA has issued in six years. This is so bad in this country right now. And there are so many of these fentanyl laced pills in this country that the DEA has issued an alert. I just, I, I, there still sounds to me like there's a disconnect between a rare DEA alert and the social media platform saying, we don't allow drugs being sold on our platform while drugs are being sold by the millions of pills on their very platforms. Right. And I would say this, This is a new and different problem. Anyone, even in the drug legalization movement, will tell you giving someone a substance under false pretenses, putting a drug user in a situation of not knowing what they're putting in their body is extremely risky and it's not tolerated anywhere. And the social media companies understand now that's what's going on and that's different and that they need to up their game and they are upping the game. All of them or just Snapchat? Well, we are working actively with Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Wow. So we have established relationships. One relationship led to another. They're all giving us ad credits, consulting with us behind the scenes on how to extend our reach on the awareness side, primarily. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say this. This problem is unique. And I've kind of identified, I have in my head kind of the three circle Venn diagram. And it's Supply reduction, which is basically law enforcement, DEA, let's say. Demand reduction, which is drug education. And harm reduction, which is the safe supply, legalize, destigmatize movement. In the face of this brand new problem, this intersection of a highly potent synthetic that's dirt cheap and very powerful with the practice of counterfeiting pills or sliding it into heroin without telling the user that it's there. Or cocaine. Or cocaine is a new thing. And each of those groups, I I think, are doubling down on their old ways of thinking and saying, because the problem's got so much worse, we need to either lock them up faster, just say no louder, or legalize everything more. And none of those approaches are going to work. We really believe that all three of these groups need to come together and sit at a table and say, how do we figure out this new problem? So when you mentioned the DEA, I would like to see the DEA, instead of calling out social media, call up social media and say, come to headquarters. You have the technology. We know the the drug dealers' practices. Let's figure out how to get these guys off these platforms. We we know from both the DEA and from the work of investigative journalists like Sam Quinones, who was a guest on our previous uh, one of our previous episodes, that this has become a huge business with the drug cartels in Mexico. They are taking chemicals they've obtained from China and in vast laboratories are able to manufacture fentanyl quickly and easily and then press it into pills that look just like Valium or Xanax or Percocet. Um, and then sell those pills. And I remember asking, you know, Sam Quinones, why would the drug dealers want to kill their own customers? I don't, that seems to be a really bad business model. Like, you know, why would you put something that deadly out on the market? And of course, it gives you a very huge high 
and then a very, and it lasts a very short time, which will drive the customers out to buy more of whatever they got the first time and got that huge high from. You know, the stories are everywhere about this fentanyl popping up in everything. We just saw a spring break, you know, episode in Florida with six West Point cadets um, uh, overdosing after doing some cocaine on spring break vacation that was laced with fentanyl. You know, there was terrible imagery of these, you know, huge, I think some of the more football players being revived out on the front lawn of this house. It's everywhere. We have your son's story. We have the other stories just in, in your, in the Bay Area where your son, near where your son was going to school. So it's a huge, huge issue. And yet it feels like it's, you're trying to stop a tsunami. You know what I mean? Like there must be times when you feel like you're the one man standing on the beach with the tsunami coming in going, where do I run and how do I stop this? It's coming from all different directions. It's disguised in, you know, ordinary pills that you can get with a prescription. It's, you know, laced into illegal drugs that many, many people die and do recreationally. It seems to be everywhere. It, it really is. And, um, we, it's a big problem and it's got a lot of different kind of tentacles to it, right? There's the border issue. There's international geopolitics with China. There's the criminal justice issue, right? We make a distinction that, that uh, our, our son was poisoned. He didn't overdose. That's an important distinction for the criminal justice system. There's all, and each of these parent groups that, that we know very well have all, a lot of them have picked these different lanes to focus on. Mm-hmm. And our tack has been, you're exactly right, Elizabeth. This is a big problem. Society has not figured out its response to it yet. What we need to do is warn the kids in the meantime. So when I give presentation to young people, I always use the analogy of what we go through out here in the West, which are these fires, right? These mm-hmm. brush fires in, in the fire season. And I say, this is like the scenario where the fire chief calls the mayor of the town and he says, the fire is between us and you. We cannot get there in time. We're doing everything we can and we'll get there eventually, but we're not going to be there for a while. You have to save yourselves. And that's my message to young people. And our message is an empowering one to young people. And we've gotten a lot of advice from people who know how to communicate with youth. They really are concerned about their peers, right? So we don't say don't do drugs. We say protect your friends. Tell your friends, you don't want this to happen to one of your friends. These pills are everywhere. And we think that because of the deception that a lot of these deaths are with kids who did not go on the street or on social media asking for fentanyl, right? So we also say to some of these audiences, we don't say, we're not saying don't do drugs. We're saying don't do these drugs because they're not what you're looking for. When you go online to get a Xanax, that's not Xanax. Right, but it's in everything. It's in everything. I mean, it is sort of a don't do drugs. I mean, I've told my kids, you, you know, it's hard to have these conversations. You guys know, you, you, you know, I know my kids are going to try alcohol and, and, you know, and I am in recovery from alcohol. So they have seen firsthand. Yeah, you too. Me too. They, they've seen firsthand what alcoholism looks like. And I've, you know, I've said, I know you're going to try it. You need to be careful. But when it comes to drugs, I have taken the stance of no drug is safe Mm -hmm. because you don't know what's in that drug. No longer can you think I'm just going to do this and it's going to be a little bit at a party or I'm just going to do that to take the edge off. Unless you have that from a doctor and filled it at a pharmacy, you cannot take that pill. So it really has become... I don't know, in my messaging to my own kids, don't do any drugs. And certainly from just watching the news, it's in every drug, potentially. No drug is risk-free when it comes to fentanyl. Right. And and what we've learned um, as we got thrust into this world involuntarily is, again, you've got the prevention camp and you've got the harm reduction camp. And the harm reduction camp will tell you that it doesn't matter how many times you tell kids don't do drugs, they're still going to do them. So let's make it safer for them, right? And I get that to a degree. But it, and Sam himself says that the cartels have ruined recreational drug use. Yes. And the problem is on the prevention side that for years, 
we use some scare tactics like, well, if you smoke a joint, you'll end up addicted to heroin. And the problem with that is then kids go to college and they smoke a joint and they go, well, that wasn't so bad. And none of my friends are getting any worse. And so I was lied to. Mm -hmm. The problem now is the drug supply is so contaminated that it is as dangerous now as it's ever been. It's worse than ever. Sam Quinones called it Russian roulette. Yes, it's Russian roulette. And, and I call it chemical soup because mm. you've got all of these amateurs. You know, for thousands of years, the substances we use to uh, intoxicate ourselves were organic. They're ultimately natural and plant-based. But with, beginning with meth and now with fentanyl, and there are others coming down the pipeline, the new business model and the new raw material are these synthetics. So you've got people, you've got a, a, a brew in, in the East of heroin, fentanyl, and xylazine, an animal tranquilizer. Because as you said, the fentanyl comes on so fast, but then wears off. The xylazine in street lingo gives it legs. Mm. And people are suffering from these disgusting open skin sores that xylazine causes because you've got these chemists trying to figure out chemical answers to meet market demand. Oh, you want a little more length to your high? Let's throw a little of this in there. Let's throw a little of that in there. So it is a mess. The drug supply has been polluted. And people from all of these different groups, supply reduction, demand reduction, harm reduction, they all agree on that point. It has never yeah. been more dangerous than now to take drugs. Well, and, and as you always say, Ed, too, what's not going to go away is stress and these synthetic drugs. So, you know, we have to really be careful and don't do drugs. If you need to go to a dispensary, you go to a dispensary um, or you con contact your doctor. I mean, that's the only way that these kids are going to be able to deal with anything. And as you just said, what's not going to go away is stress. We know right. that, right. you know, right. this, this pandemic um, has really, really created a mental health crisis in this country when it comes to anxiety and depression. We know that the population most impacted has been adolescents and young adults and many of them are, are, you know, are turning to drugs, even if, I mean, and I'm, I'm not talking, you know, drugs in the sense of I'm going to go shoot up. I'm talking about, I just need, you know, a Valium to take the edge off because I'm feeling anxious and panicky. And now that Valium, if you don't get it from a doctor who might not be willing to prescribe it just for stress, uh, if you go and get that Valium from someplace other than a doctor or a pharmacist can be laced with something that can kill you. Do you think when the two of you are out talking, especially to young audiences, that your message is getting through? Absolutely. We do. Absolutely. And, and, and again, we have taken the counsel of um, people who communicate with kids, educators um, and other experts. And um, we kind of couch it in more of a public health alert. It's information. Um, one of the things that I'm starting to say in my presentations is we still say just say no, but we spell it different. We spell it K-N-O-W. It's more important than ever that you know what's going on in the drug world. Um, because when we were growing up, the way it was described was that you're going to at some point experiment with drugs. And the warning was, if you do it too much or too often, you might get off on the wrong track in your journey. And if you do that, that can lead to addiction and eventually accidental overdose. You'll take too much of your drug of choice. These days, the drug landscape is more like a minefield, where if you don't know where the mines are, your next step could be your last. And your first, your first step could be your last. You don't have to get addicted and then take it so much and then that you overdose. I mean, that is... Are you concerned at all that, you know, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign has been, you know, pretty critically viewed these days as being naive and unrealistic and, you know, most devastatingly, completely, um, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work, Just Say No. Yeah. And yet I feel like we're back at that stage now where I know that's what I'm saying to my kids. You can't do any drugs. Like we're back at just say no, because all drugs all of a sudden become so dangerous. Yeah, it's true. And there's data to support the fact that 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 did not work very well. On the other hand, 
again, my experience with these different stakeholder groups is that there's too much kind of absolutist thinking going on. So I don't mind a harm reduction person who says not everyone's going to relate to a prevention message of just say no. But what they do say is nobody relates to that. It's a waste of time. Don't bother. Well, you can't measure a negative. They can't measure all the kids who don't show up at the doorstep of a recovery center because the message they heard in eighth grade did take hold, right? So some kids are significant, you know, subs, you know, they're they're warned enough and they're concerned enough when they hear these warnings that they do stay away from, from dangerous drug behavior. On the other hand, we really do have to change the way we talk to young people about drugs in America. Um, and it has to start younger and it has to be a conversation that includes cough syrup and Tylenol. Parents need to start talking to their kids about this is why we give you this medication. This is what it's for. And no, brother, you don't get any because you don't have a headache, but sister does. We give it to her and she only takes this much. And we don't ever take anything that doesn't come from mom and dad. And, and we start having the conversation about know where your drugs come from um, very, very early on. And we have done market research with our partners. In fact, Snapchat commissioned uh, a, a survey of about 2,000 uh, young people under the age of like between 13 and 24. And one of the things that comes out is this generation really does want to have the facts. They're bombarded with information and data all the time. And so if we take the tack in, in empowering them and saying, here's what you need to know, and then trusting them a little bit to make a better informed decision, that might be a, a little one of the ways we update the drug conversation. And then I know we keep referring back to our friend Sam. I agree with his take that we need to start talking about the neurobiology and what goes on in your brain and your body with these substances. Because again, this information is empowering, and that's what these young people want. What more should all these tech companies be doing to try and stop the sales of these pills on their sites, given the, you know, the, the, it, you know, the reality of what we're dealing with here, you know, on Snapchat messages that vanish as soon as you read them, um, you know, the, dealing with anything on the Internet can be so difficult. But a lot of these tech companies have been under fire for a lot of their practices when it comes to self-image and self-harm, especially with our young adults and our kids. What should they be doing specifically about this that they're not already doing? I would say working together um, because there is a lot of overlap. There's a lot of technology that can be shared. There's a lot of data gathered on the back end of all of these sites and uh, networks that uh, could be shared together to figure out, you know, um, what the drug dealers are doing and where they're doing it. So a kind of coalition of tech firms that would come together to share information. Again, I'd like to see the government and government agencies get behind that and encourage that and engage with the tech companies, right? And, and uh, in, in that kind of a joint effort. Um, we need to, you know, one of the things that we people say is, well, it's whack-a-mole. And it does feel like whack-a-mole, though. It is whack-a-mole. And, and, and this is why we focus so much on educating kids and reducing demand, because dealers will always pivot, and cartels will always pivot. And the DEA will say, we only stop about 10% of the drugs that come into this country. And it's whack-a-mole, and they change tactics, and we're doing the best we can. And most of the time, when a social media company makes the same statement, we're doing the best we can. It's whack-a-mole. They change their tactics all the time. This is really complicated. When the DEA says it, the public goes, thank you for your service. How can we support you? When the social media tech companies do it, the public goes, you should be out of business. You're not doing enough. I'd like to see the hyperbole and the finger pointing settle down a little bit and people sitting around the table and rolling up their sleeves and sharpening their pencils together to address this problem. I wonder, Elizabeth, if the country isn't finally fed up. I wonder if the cartels haven't finally overplayed their hand with this tactic of working really hard to produce realistic looking counterfeit medicines and sell them to minors in America. 
it could be that that's the last straw. And it's time for us finally to come together and address that problem. And I will tell you one last thing, because I want to make sure we get this in. A lot of parent groups have been working for a long time to raise awareness. And 2022 is going to be a watershed movement for that effort, a watershed moment for that movement and that effort. And one of the things that we're doing is in May, um, we're involved with the group that's going to put put on um, a National Fentanyl Awareness Day on the 10th of May, which is right at the front end of Mental Health Month. And this is going to be big. We have a very big name corporate sponsors. We have an advisory council with very powerful, high profile experts on it. And these people are all coming together to really ring the bell loudly on a national stage that it's time to get serious about this issue and tell, make sure everyone knows that it's going on. Right, right. Well, thank you so much. Your nonprofit, Song for Charlie, established in your son's name, has done amazing work on this. And it is so important to get this word out to everyone about the dangers of these pills. It's just incredible. Um, as we leave, I just would like to hear, you know, tell me about your son. Um, what was he like? This always happens. <laughs> um, oh, no. Charlie um, was a great guy. Um, everybody loved to be around Charlie. Um, he kind of, he was, he was known as the glue. He'd bring all different groups of friends together and then they'd all be friends. Um, he was smart. He was kind. He was thoughtful. Um, he was funny. He had a you know, belly laugh. Um, yeah, he was just a great guy. He was just a great guy. We miss him terribly. Our whole family does. Yeah. And, and we say a lot to the people we come in contact with that this is just such a disaster. We say, we, you really do not want this to happen to you. We're almost two years out from Charlie's death, and it's still difficult to talk about. What we're trying to do, Elizabeth, what gives us a little bit of hope is that these deaths among young people who are being deceived by these fake pills, these are the most preventable deaths in the entire spectrum of the drug overdose crisis because these kids are not asking for fentanyl. So if we can tell them, if, if they can spread the word and, and word starts to get out, that these pills are fake. This is not what you want. The drug supply is really contaminated right now. We think we can chip away at this category of victim and change the minds and change the behaviors. And that's that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Charlie didn't want to die. And he, he just wanted to take the edge off on a Thursday afternoon. And, you know, this is what happened. Well, Ed and Mary, I, there are a lot of people who I think part of them would have died losing their son and would never have been able to stand back up after being knocked down by a loss like this and uh, make it a cause and make it their life's mission to prevent this tragedy from happening to other families. So um, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. Thank you for being on Heart of the Matter. Mary, thank you for just showing me that handsome picture of your son. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here. and. Uh, and good luck with your work. I really hope you, I really hope people will listen to you as you go around the country and share your story and share your mission. Thank you. And thank you for spreading the word as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for listening today to Heart of the Matter. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And as a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who is struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. We'll talk to you soon.